and it is important that we do seek God. And even though we're like this, at least we have some semblance of oneness a little bit. First Thessalonians chapter five, I'd like to read verses one through five. And I won't speak on all these verses today, really just verses one through three, but I may reference a little bit verse four or five. So I'll read them. First Thessalonians five. But of the times and, and the, the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Appropriate words. Let's pray. Father, thank you now for your word. Challenge us about the great day of you, O Lord, the day of the Lord. Father, it's a complicated subject, we realize, but help us to seek to understand it. And Lord, we do thank you that the, your day is coming, and we pray that we would be ready for it to come. And Lord, thank you so much that you are God. The earth is yours and the fullness thereof. And you have not abdicated your rule over planet earth. You are still God of heaven and earth. Though, Lord, there has been a usurpation, in some ways, as Satan is the God of many of this world. So we know there is darkness and destruction. There is murder in this life, O oh God. And we pray for your protective hand over each of us. And Lord, help us to trust you and wait on you, Lord, and to live as children of light as we live even in these dark days, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the message today is on the day of the Lord. And don't you look forward to special days in which you are the center of attention? Maybe like a wedding day where a, the bride especially is the center of everyone's attention and so much care and preparation is put into that great day where the bride has her big day. And I was re re reminded of this today when uh, Sid put on Facebook a picture of his lovely wife, Ruth, on her big wedding day a few years ago. And I was blessed to officiate that wedding and to celebrate that big day for Sid and Ruth. And today is another big day for Ruth as it's her birthday. So we do say happy birthday to Ruth on her big day. And isn't a birthday just like a great day for you still? Especially when you're a kid, I remember my birthday. Don't you remember look, looking forward to your birthday when you were a kid? And my mom would always make us a cake of our choosing. And our family favorite, I don't know how come it, this became our family favorite because really I've never eaten it hardly since then. I don't think anybody could make a cake like this the way my mom made angel food cake. Do you like angel food cake? I don't even like angel food cake, but my mom's angel food cake with orange frosting, not red raspberry on the frosting. No, for the angel food cake, it was orange frosting. And my, my brother, my sisters, for whatever reason, I think we always like that cake. So we asked our mom on our big day to make an angel food cake with orange frosting. And then I would get to pick the dinner that we would all eat. And you know what exotic fare I would choose? You will never guess. You know what? The scrumptious cuisine of my choosing was an English muffin pizza. <laughs> Have you ever had an English muffin pizza? They're really good. You would put an English muffin, you put a little tomato sauce and some mozzarella and, and English. That was like my favorite meal as a little kid. But I also picked barbecue chicken sometimes. I love barbecue chicken, but that was my big day as a kid. In a sense, 
the day of the Lord is God's big day. Now, when you have a wedding day, a birthday, you know the day, you know your big day, but God's big day, the day of the Lord, we're going to see we don't know the day, we don't know the hour, the year, the time, but it's God's big day. So let's talk about the day of the Lord. What is the day of the Lord? So we want to try to answer that question. What will it be like? What are some characteristics of the day of the Lord? We're going to see that this morning. And then this question, what's so big about God's big day? Well, it is a big deal because there are, I, I, I read literally, I don't know how many, 100 Bible verses, maybe even more that deal with the day of the Lord. And if, in fact, in the bottom of your note sheet, actually, if you printed out the note sheet today, at the bottom, I did put all the biblical references specifically to the day of the Lord. And those are all the references to the day of the Lord. But many times, the day of the Lord is referred to as that day, or the day, or the great day. And that appears more than 75 times throughout the Old Testament. And so this is a huge subject, the day of the Lord. And in this passage of scripture, Paul is encouraging the believers of Thessalonica who claim Jesus Christ as their savior to walk as children of light as they are waiting for this day of the Lord and the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ in the clouds. What we see in this passage of scripture as well is that children of God, believers, are totally different and distinct from the unsaved of the world. Our conduct should be different from the conduct of those who do not know Jesus. And our destiny is different. We are children of light, we're going to be in the presence of Jesus as Paul finished chapter 4 forever. This passage says those who are not saved will experience great darkness and even the wrath of God. But we as the church are not appointed to wrath and we don't live and we're not going to experience the darkness that this world is going to experience. So we're going to see that. So I'm just going to say today as we look at this passage, a few general things about the day of the Lord, then look specifically at this passage of scripture. So let's go. First Thessalonians chapter five, the day of the Lord. The first thing I want to say about this is it is a definite day. He says for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now we are certain when I say it's definite, it's definitely going to happen. Without a doubt, without any question, this is a certain day. It is coming, but we are uncertain of the time. Now, let me also say about the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is not just a 24-hour period of time. It is, we're going to see an extended period of time. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, I know that for a lot of reasons, but go to 2 Peter chapter 3. And many times people say, oh, one day is with the Lord is a thousand years. And that's true. And the, the, that verse is given in the context of the day of the Lord. So God calls his day a day. But one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. And that's the context of this. So the day of the Lord could well be a thousand years or even more. Second Peter chapter 3, and I'll just read verses. We're going to look at a lot of verses. So I hope you have your Bible. And please turn with me to some of the references. Uh, I won't ask you to turn to all of them, but I will ask you to turn. Second Peter chapter 3, it says in verse 8, actually, Second Peter 3, 8, it says, Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. A thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord, you see, the context of all this is the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. So he uses the same expression that Paul himself used, Jesus himself used, will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The earth also, and the works 
that are therein shall be burned up. So the day of the Lord goes all the way to the destruction of this present heaven and earth until this, there will be the new heaven and the new earth. That's certain. The day of the Lord is certain. We're uncertain as to when. Now when? That's what we all like, would like to know. When, Lord? Remember the disciples asked the Lord, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? When? We would like to know when. But the Lord said, but of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only, Matthew 24, 36. Now, I want to say this very clearly, very, very straight, beloved. We don't know when this day of the Lord is going to happen. We don't know when the rapture is going to happen. We don't know when the definite day of the Lord is going to happen. And date setting for the coming of Christ or the day of the Lord marks a person, in fact, I believe, as a false teacher. Date setting, as I have stated here, has, does huge damage to the cause of Christ. The faith of some is overthrown. When people set dates and the Lord doesn't come, then their faith could well be overthrown. Unsaved, hardened their hearts. Oh, you Christians are setting dates and your Lord is never going to come. Where is now the, the appearance of your Lord? Even people mock and scoff with that we preach the coming of Christ. And they may even say, well, when is his appearing? We don't know when. Be ready. And strangely, it gives birth to cults and false teachers. Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, in a sense, had their birth and rise and growth into more with more members when they proclaimed a day of the, of the coming of Christ, and he didn't come. And yet these cults continue on. A few years ago, Harold Camping, who led the family radio ministry here in New York, many people were clamoring for the coming of the Lord. It was even in May, I forget what year, but Jesus didn't come. It was a huge embarrassment. Now, please look in Acts chapter 1. And here Jesus clearly says, we will not know. Just before he's about to ascend into heaven, the disciples came to him in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 6 and 7. And here we see in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, it says, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Will you establish your kingdom to Israel on the earth? And it's amazing, Jesus did not say, oh, no, there's not going to be a kingdom on earth. The church is going to replace Israel. No, he didn't say that. The church is not going to replace Israel, and the kingdom will be established on earth. So he didn't invalidate the reality of a coming kingdom, which is part of the day of the Lord. So they said, will, will it be now? But he said to them, now this is important when we consider 1 Thessalonians 5. Notice what he said. He said to them, it is not for you to know the, notice these two expressions, times and seasons, which the Father hath put in his own authority, his own power. So it's not for you to know the times and seasons. Now go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 1. This is the only time where we see both of those words used together, times and seasons. In Acts 1, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And so that's why Paul says that there was no need for him to write concerning what he says, of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. How come? So why, did, why was there no need for him to have to write to them? Because Jesus had clearly told them that God has put these things in his own power and authority. And so we just rest ourselves. Many things happen in this world, and we want to know when and we want to know why. Many things the Father hath put in his own power, and we have to rest in him. But it's a definite day, the day of the Lord. It's certainly coming, but it's uncertain as to when. Never, ever set a date. And if you're following a teacher that sets a day, stop following that teacher. That is a mark of a false teacher when they set a day for the coming of Jesus Christ. And it gives rise to other false teaching. So I warn us about that. Number two, the day of the Lord is a distinct day. 
There will be no day like it. I believe the day of the Lord will follow the church age. It is a distinct day. Now, I'm, when I say distinct, what I mean is it is something different and distinct from what he has just been discussing in chapter 4, which was the rapture, which was the coming of Christ or the parousia. I believe it, the progression in chapter 4, he's talking about the rapture. He's talking about the parousia. That's in chapter 4, verse 15, the coming of the Lord and the Lord descending from heaven with a shout. And then it says, those which are alive and remain, the church, the church age, will be caught up and raptured with Jesus Christ. And now he's talking about something different. So the progression is first the rapture, and then the day of the Lord in the text. And I believe that it's something different. In other words, the day of the Lord is different and distinct from the rapture of the church. It's not the same thing. He uses different words even to describe these different events. One, he uses the word parousia, and here he uses the day of the Lord. Now, look at this verse. I have it on the screen. And the day of the Lord, we're going to see, is a time of darkness and destruction. And here's why I'm saying, too, the day of the Lord is distinct from the rapture. Look at Amos 5.18. There's many reasons for this, but this is one. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. In other words, this day is, a, a, the, the, when the day of the Lord comes, it will come with God's wrath and destruction and darkness. We see that in this text. We see destruction in verse 3. We see darkness in verse 4. And we see wrath in verse number 9. He says, woe to you that desire this day of the Lord. What end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. So he says, don't desire this day of the Lord's coming destruction and darkness. But let me ask you a question. Do we desire the coming of the Lord in the rapture? Is that darkness for us? No, that's a blessed hope. We look forward to the rapture. So that's another reason why I'm saying that the coming of the Lord and the rapturing of the church, this is the, the blessed hope of Jesus Christ. We look forward to this. But the day of the Lord beginning will be a time of great devastation. Now, let's look at your chart for just a moment, and I have it up. I'll put it up here on the screen. Okay, so this is my chart. I did it myself, so if you have any questions, you can ask me about it. I didn't get this one online. Some of the things that I did, if I agreed with a chart online, I would use it. But I will just say, there are different views, obviously, on this. Okay, so I'm not going to say definitively my view is the only way. If, it's, if, if you don't agree with me, take the hot. No, no. And, and probably the biggest disagreement would be on when does the day of the Lord actually begin? But I, I believe that the day of the Lord begins after the rapture. So here's, if you look at this chart, Notice, can you, find, can you see my cursor? Can you follow my cursor? Okay, so here we are on earth and we're in the church age. So here's the heavens. This is where Satan is now the prince of the power of the air in the heaven. Satan is represented by this darker line, okay? And that's, that's kind of his destiny. We don't have to look into all that now. But then here, up here is heaven. So what we're saying, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 17, the rapture of the church, which can happen at any moment, Jesus and the way I have the chart, he comes back in the clouds. He doesn't come back to the earth. He comes back in the air where Satan is the prince of the power. And the church goes up, 1 Thessalonians 4, meets the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I believe that this rapture will trigger then the coming of the Antichrist into the world. He'll sign a peace treaty with Israel, and that will begin the tribulation time a seven-year period of time, and it's in two, three-and-a-half-year periods. So this is marked by this right here. So the tribulation will begin after the rapture of the church. The first three-and-a-half years we can call the beginning of sorrows. The second three-and-a-half years we can call the great tribulation. But I do believe that the tribulation time entirely is a period of God's wrath. And judgment. And I'll mention that as well. 
So now when the church is raptured, two things are going to happen with us. We're going to be with the Lord in heaven. There will be the judgment seat of the believer where we will receive rewards. And then there will be the marriage supper of the Lamb. We will be experiencing light. We will be delivered from the wrath of this period of time, of the tribulation. And that's consistent with these verses where he says in verse 4, for example, but you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. So this day, the day of the Lord, will not overtake us as a thief. Why? Why won't it overtake us as a thief? Because we won't be here. We'll be raptured out of it. He says in verse 5, you're the children of light. This is going to be a day of darkness. We're the children of light. So we're not going to be in this midst of darkness. This will be a time of destruction. Verse number 3. And, and if you look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, he says, God has not appointed us to the wrath of this destruction period of time. This is a time of great wrath, darkness, and destruction. God has an appointed. We'll be in heaven with the Lord, you see. So the tribulation will be will start the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord will then continue throughout this period of time, through his second coming. We're going to look more at this next week. I'll show you all the verses next week. But just as a, as a quick understanding, the day of the Lord will then, this is the great day of, of the Lord, where Jesus Christ will come back, culminate the battle of Armageddon. Satan, you see here at this time, I'm sorry, the beast and the false prophet, See here, I have the beast and the false prophet will be cast into the lake of fire. The day of the Lord will continue, though, through the thousand-year millennial kingdom. A thousand years is as one day. The, the thousand years, and after that, will be the great white throne judgment. And then the first heaven and the first earth pass away. And I have some of the verses here, Second Peter chapter 3. We'll look at these next week. This will conclude the day of the Lord. So the day of the Lord is this extended period of time. It's a distinct day, the day of the Lord. That's my understanding of it. You can ask questions after the service. So number three, it is a divine day. It's a divine day of God's direct intervention. So when I, when, uh, so I believe the day of the Lord, it's a definite day, it's going to happen. It's a distinct day. It's different from any other period of time in history. Different from the church age, the day of the Lord is unique. It's in the future still. It's a great period. It's this period of time. And it's a divine day. What I mean by that, it's a time of God's direct divine intervention belonging to him. God will reveal his holy character. He will righteously judge the wicked. And then when Christ comes, he will rule with righteousness. What we see in the world today through this pandemic and even through all of this injustice, then triggering all of these. And I, I have absolutely zero problem with peaceful protests. And like I said in my statement, peaceful protest is necessary. But the violence is frightening. What's happening in our nation. But nevertheless, what this all shows is we need a, we need a king who can handle all these things. The Bible says Jesus is going to rule with a rod of iron. And he'll put down any rebellion. And he will righteously judge and rule the world in truth and righteousness during the millennial kingdom. And there will be political peace, the political peace that man longs for, the perfect justice of a king and judge and a lawgiver will be all found in Jesus himself on this day of the Lord. Now, go please to the book of Joel. If you can turn with me to the book of Joel. I want to read some day of the Lord verses in the book of Joel that show the divine day. The book of Joel features this term, the day of the Lord. And I have these verses on the screen. That's also at the bottom of your note sheet. So right after Hosea is Joel in the Minor Prophets. And Joel chapter 1, verse 15 the day of the Lord will be destruction. And in the book of Joel, part of this day of the Lord was going to be a destruction of locusts upon the land. And we're even seeing this presently. Locust swarms in Kenya and Somalia and Ethiopia. They're experiencing that on top of the pandemic. This, is a, this world is full of trial. 
but it's going to it's going to intensify all these things are the birth pangs of even more joel chapter 1 verse 15 it says alas for the day for the day of the lord is at hand and as a destruction from the almighty shall it come joel chapter 2 verse 1 blow ye the trumpet in zion sound an alarm in my holy mountain let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the lord cometh for it is nigh at hand a day of darkness and of gloominess a day of clouds and thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains a great people and strong there hath not been ever the like neither shall there be any more after it even to the years of many generations look please in joel chapter 2 verse 11 it says there or verse 10 it says the earth shall quake before them the heavens shall tremble the sun and the moon shall be dark the stars shall withdraw their shining and the lord shall utter his voice before his army for his camp is very great for he is strong that executeth the word for the day of the lord is great and very terrible who can abide it so it's going to be a time terrible notice the words terrible who can abide it gloominess darkness it's going to be a day of god's divine wrath and judgment now in chapter 2 he also mentions in verse 30 and 31 he, he says i will show wonders joel chapter 2 verse 30 and 31 i will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth blood fire pillars of smoke if you read the book of revelation and all the judgments of the tribulation i believe those three words summarize all the judgments of the seals the trumpets and the vials there's blood there's fire and pillars of smoke and we are even seeing that throughout our nation where there's fire there's pillars of smoke and it's going to be intensified we are seeing the birth pangs of this pandemic and even now of everything we're going through as a nation of the day of the lord and he says before the and the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the lord come and then we see it again in chapter 3 just to read all of them in Joel, it says in Joel chapter 3, verse 14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake, and the Lord shall be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Now, you know what's incredible and amazing about a lot of these prophecies is there was something of an immediate fulfillment to them. If you read all of the passages of the day of the Lord, when I say an immediate fulfillment, there was an immediate fulfillment in the past. In other words, God's direct divine intervention and bringing judgment upon the nations such as Egypt or Babylon and maybe even Judah and Israel so that the day of the lord had an immediate fulfillment now if you look as well in joel chapter 2 if you go back to joel chapter 2 we see that in a, in a way the immediate fulfillment in joel's day had to do with a locust army destroying the nation and that's why god says in joel chapter 2 verse 25 and i have the verse on the screen i will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten the canker worm the caterpillar the palmer worm my great army which i sent among you so what i'm saying is there was somewhat of an immediate fulfillment but then there was the ultimate fulfillment that hasn't even occurred yet the day of the lord when god is going to bring the tribulation into the world after the rapture of the church and we see the same thing a question was asked by one of our brothers last week in our q a about matthew 24. in matthew 24 is jesus talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, or is he talking about the coming tribulation? And I would say both. So just as Old Testament prophecy sometimes had an immediate fulfillment, and then a far reaching fulfillment of the coming of the Lord with uh, at the center of it. So Jesus's teaching had an immediate fulfillment, the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, but then the ultimate fulfillment will be when he raptures the church and then be, begins the tribulation time so i believe that the tribulation could be all forms of judgment blood fire pillars of smoke as well as 
It could be insect armies and, and fires, and we're seeing even fires in our world last year in Australia, as well as in California. So it's a divine day. Now, I want us to look at the description of this day. So look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And we'll look a little more carefully at this now. First Thessalonians chapter 5. So just, I've said so far that the day of the Lord is, is going to be a definite day. It's certainly coming. It's distinct. It's a distinct day from the rapture. It's going to start after the rapture with the tribulation. And it's a divine day of God's direct intervention. Number four, a description of the day. The first thing we see in this description is that it will come with unexpected suddenness as a thief in the night. That's in verse two. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night. Now, I have the thief in the night passages here written for you. But the words that Paul uses, uses here are very significant. He says, the day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night. Verse three, for when they shall say peace and safety, Peace, meaning rest and quietness. Oh, everything's quiet. Everything's peaceful. Safety. Everything's stable. There's a stability, a certainty. Oh, there's a, a prosperity going on. Peace and safety. Then all of a sudden, the day of the Lord will interrupt the security, the peace, the stability. It will come with unexpected suddenness, like a thief in the night. And he says, sudden destruction, sudden. The word sudden means unexpected. That word sudden is only used twice in the whole New Testament, and it's used here by Jesus in Luke 21, 34. I have the verse. It says, take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting, drunkenness, cares of this life, and that day come upon you unawares. That word unawares is the same word as sudden. So sudden has the idea of, you didn't, you didn't see that happening. You didn't see that coming. That was a pitch I didn't expect. You know, when this year started, could you have expected a worldwide pandemic? That was sudden. When this year started, could you have expected that a police officer would basically murder a man in front of all of us through a videotape by pushing his knee against a man's neck and horribly, outrageously kill him. And that would precipitate to riots around our country. Could you have imagined when this year started that a police department would be burned to the ground in one of our American cities and these other things that are happening now? <laughs> this has been sudden, hasn't it? This is a foretaste, a birth pang of the day of the Lord. It will come with great suddenness. And Jesus himself used the flood of the days of Noah and the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah in Luke chapter 16. But can you go to Matthew 24 and Luke 17, but also Matthew? Go to Matthew 24, please. And I would like to read these verses. And it has one of the thief in the night passages in it. But in Luke chapter 24, look at verse 36. It's a lot of really what we're saying in these verses. Luke chapter 24, verse 36. He says, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Took them all away. So the, the ones who were taken away, the ones taken in judgment, not the one. Noah was preserved in the ark. But it says those who are taken away in verse 39 are the ones taken away in judgment. And then he says in verse 40, then shall two be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. So the taken here is also, it's not a rapture. This is not the rapture of the church in view. This is actually those taken in judgment at the end 
uh, of the tribulation time and before the coming of, of the Lord. They're going to be taken in judgment. And, and so then he says, watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in, in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. And so he's going to come with sudden destruction. Okay. I'm sorry, Matt, that was Matthew 24, verses 36 through 44. Matthew 26, verse, Matthew 24, 36 through 44. Okay, so next we see that the description of this day, not only does it come with a sudden destruction, but there will be unparalleled devastation. And we see this as well. This doesn't that. <laughs> this doesn't sound really uh, happy, does it? It's not happy time. The day of the Lord will be darkness, gloominess, destruction. So this word, this language is consistent with the Old Testament readings that we saw in the book of Amos, chapter 5. Woe to the one who desires the day of the Lord. It's a day of darkness and not light. And in Joel. So it's a time of unparalleled devastation. Now, I believe that the seven-year period of the day of the Lord, this seven-year period, beginning the first three and a half years, the beginning of sorrows, Matthew 24. The second three and a half years, the year of uh, time of great tribulation. But it's all a period of wrath and the judgment of God. Although it's divided into those two parts, the nature of the tribulation, the character of the tribulation is one. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Because think of this, it begins with the four horsemen. Remember the first horseman? The rider on the white horse is the Antichrist. That's part of the judgment of God, that the Antichrist will enter into the world and, and, and almost peacefully in order to promise some kind of false peace, peace and safety. But it will be a false peace. And then after that, there will be the, the second rider is the rider on the red horse. And then there's the rider on the black horse. Then there's the rider on the pale horse. And those riders, each of them had judgments, the wrath of God devastation on the earth of war and famine and death. So look in Zephaniah, please. If you go back with me to Zephaniah, chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. <laughs> Is it uh, Habakkuk? Zephaniah. You know, Zephaniah. Wow, that's a hard book to find. I, I couldn't find it. I finally found it. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 14, it says, The great day of the Lord is near. It is near. And hasteth greatly even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty man shall cry there bitterly. The day of the Lord, that day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble, distress, weariness, desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet, an alarm against the fenced cities. Listen, we need to prepare to meet God. The judgment of God will come upon you, dear friend, if you're not saved. This day of the Lord and the judgment, the gloominess, the wrath, the destruction will come upon you if, you, if you're not saved and you're here after the rapture of the church. You need to be saved if you're not saved. You need to cry out to God for mercy. And if you die today without Jesus Christ, dear friend, there is judgment from God. There's a place of hell, everlasting fire, destruction from God. Turn from your sin and turn to Jesus Christ. The day of the Lord is near, the Bible says. Jesus Christ is coming with this great day. It will be unparalleled devastation. And lastly, it's going to come with undeniable reality. And here Paul makes an analogy that was given in our scripture reading today from Isaiah 13. It will come as travail upon a woman with child. If you go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, he says, Sudden destruction come upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. 
The they there is the unsaved. They will not escape the undeniable reality. So the analogy here is given in Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 8 that was read, and it emphasizes the, the undeniable inevitability of this coming event, that the day of the Lord is inescapable. Just as a nine-month-old fetus is in a woman's body, if, if it's in there, it must inevitably come out. <laughs> One way or the other, that baby is going to come out of the woman's womb. And so the day of the Lord is sure like that. It's inescapable. There's no escaping the day of the Lord coming. So let's come to a conclusion. Do you see, do you have your outline? Do you have your outline? If you could look at the bottom of your outline there, and I also have it up here on the screen, but I want to read now, and we're going to look more into this, Lord willing, next week, but I want to just now finish by really giving you a definition. This is actually just half of my sermon. I cut it in half because I knew it would be too long. So the definition of this day of the Lord, to kind of summarize some things I've already said, and then we'll build on it later. The day of the Lord is God's future, direct, dramatic intervention in man's affairs, including both destruction and deliverance, because it will be the tribulation time destruction, but deliverance it will be when he comes again and sets up his kingdom on earth. It is triggered by the rapture, and officially commences, I think you have a blank there, commences with the tribulation. So the day of the Lord begins with the tribulation. And then it culminates in his glorious revelation return. That's the great day of the day of the Lord. And then it will continue through the millennium and through the great white throne judgment. And it will conclude with the dissolving of the present heaven and earth. Second Peter chapter 3. Okay, so now, look at your chart. I'm going to put the chart up here again, and I'm going to read the statement one last time, and I'm just going to kind of walk through this chart so you can see what I'm saying. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm saying that the day of the Lord is God's future, dramatic and direct intervention on men's affairs. It's going to come after the rapture of the church. It will begin with the tribulation. It will include both destruction, especially during this tribulation time, and the revelation of Christ coming back and the battle of Armageddon will be time of great, uh, will be a warfare. The sword will go out of his mouth and he'll destroy the nations. And then it includes a time of deliverance, the thousand year millennial kingdom. And I'm going to show you that next week. I'll show you the verses that the great day of the Lord includes the millennium. Then, so what I'm saying here is that the, the rapture triggers the day of the Lord. And then the, the day of the Lord officially commences or begins with the tribulation. And then it will continue through the tribulation, the day of the Lord will culminate with the revelation return in glory of Jesus Christ. Then it will continue through the millennial kingdom. It will include the great white throne judgment here. And it will conclude with the first heaven and earth passing away, Second Peter chapter 3. And that will conclude the day of the Lord. So you see in the chart, I have the day of the Lord beginning with the tribulation, ending with the first heaven and earth passing away. And this is, this is not fundamental for everyone. Uh, this is my understanding of it. This is my best understanding of it. And then there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and the curse of sin will be forever gone, and Jesus Christ will rule and reign forever in a new heaven and a new earth, and we'll be with Jesus. So now, with all of that in mind, let's, just con let's conclude by going to Romans chapter 13. What kind of person should we be? With all of this in view, so what? Okay, so this day's coming. So what? 
What's, wh what does that mean to us today? Romans chapter 13 and verse 11 and 12. And here's the application. He says, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time for us to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. We are closer today to the great day of the Lord than ever before. We are seeing incredible events in our lives. Beloved, it is time for us to wake up. It is time for us to make sure we're right with God. It is time for us to open our mouth for Jesus. It is time for us to tell our friends about Christ and about coming to him, about repenting of sin, believing in him. It is time for us to wake up out of sleep. The night is far spent. You've been living in the, if you've been living in the darkness, come out of the darkness and come to the light. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Cast off the works of darkness that we see all around us. Let us put on the armor of light. Walk as children of light. Walk in love. Walk in peace. Walk knowing that you have been delivered from the wrath to come. And walk as a witness for him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this wonderful day that you've given to us. A beautiful day, God. God, I pray that you will give us strength to walk with you as children of light in these dark times. Thank you that the path of the just is like a shining light that shineth more and more unto a perfect day. And we know that we are different in conduct and in destiny from the unsaved people of this world. Oh God, we pray that you would watch over us. We pray, God, that you would lead us. We pray that you would bless each person under the sound of my voice right now with protection and peace and their children, their grandchildren. God, we pray for our children today and grandchildren. We pray for the young people of America. Oh God, America needs you. Oh God, America needs salvation. Oh God, America needs revival. We need to turn to you, God, as the one who would bring justice. These things are happening because of our sins, oh God. Oh God, would you cleanse us? Have mercy upon us. Forgive us, oh God. Please restore a peace to our land and a fairness toward all and a justice. That is what people are clamoring for, dear God. Oh, would you do it? Would you shine the, the light of your love, Lord? As, as it seems, even during this time of pandemic, it has not been a time of where people have turned back to you or turned from their sin. Help people to turn from their sin, to turn from their drunkenness, to turn from their adultery, to turn from their fornications, to turn, oh God, and to turn to you, Lord, and that you would pour out the light of your salvation, pour out the love of your forgiveness, cleanse people with the power of the blood of Jesus. Lord, there's power in your blood to cleanse from sin, oh God. Would you please cleanse and work and draw, oh God, to yourself. Only you can do it. Have mercy upon us now, Lord. Grant us a beautiful day with peace. And we love you and praise you. And our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. And who would say, Pastor Matt, I'm not sure that I'm saved. I'm not sure if I died today that I'd go to heaven. But I want to know, and I must know, and I do believe in my heart that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, and he rose again, and I'm going to call out to him. I must cry to him, for today is the day of salvation. Would you call upon Jesus today? A prayer from your heart. Say, oh God, I am a guilty sinner, worthy of death in hell. But I thank you, you died for me. You love me. You rose again. You're alive now. I call upon you. I believe on you, Lord, that you have been raised from the dead. And you say, if I call upon you, I will be saved. So I call, save me, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I pray that someone is crying out to, to you for salvation. I pray, God, as well, for those of us who know you. And may it be our prayer, Lord, help us to walk. As children of light, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. For